Good morning, City of Angels Church. You know, my name is Caleb Cohen. This is my beautiful wife, Lizbeth Cohen, and we bring you warm greetings from warm Riverside here in the Inland Empire. Uh, my wife and I originally moved here from the Oregon churches, but we're so grateful to be here in LA. You know, a great scripture to start us out with is in Psalm 126. I think about this great passage in verse one. It says, when the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, we were like men and women who dreamed. It was said among the nations that the Lord has done great things for them, but the Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. You know, of course, great news is happening all over the world. Great news is happening in Los Angeles, and we can say that, that great things has been done for them. But one great thing I can say is, hey, the Lord has done great things for us, even in the Inland Empire. You know, it says that people dreamed in the scriptures. And one of the dreams we have in the Inland Empire is to convert our physically family members. And it's amazing to think about all the families we actually have in the church where the parents and the siblings or the son and daughter are disciples. You know, you got the Zapata family, the Bradley family, the Juarez family. I think about Ivana who converted her sister, Veronica. You got the Juarez family, you got the Stasher family, the Kelly family, the Tucker family, the Lovachev family, and it's amazing, even two campus students just this last couple weeks baptized their moms. And so it's amazing to think about all the dreams coming true in the Inland Empire, but I'm just super excited to get some more dreams and some more vision in today's service. I'm gonna give it over to my beautiful wife, Lizbeth, to share some good news as well. Well, I just want to welcome all the ladies watching this morning. I'm so excited to worship with you guys. And I really love the scripture that Caleb shared because amidst all the sad news that's going on in the world, we get to look forward to the good news that is happening in the kingdom. And it's been awesome to be able to read the good news email this past week and see all of the kingdom appointments, the cyber ministry appointments, all the baptisms that are continually happening um, all around the world and in the family um, churches. And so I'm so, so excited to have been able to read about all of the good news and especially the babies that have been born, all the kingdom weddings that have been uh, happening amidst this virus. And so I just want to encourage all the women to look forward to the good news um, and to know that there is hope. And so with that, I just want to welcome all the ladies to our worship service this morning. Amen. Thank you, sweetie. Today's going to be a great service, guys. We're in for a real treat. We love you guys so much. We're so grateful to worship with you guys this morning. And with that, we want to welcome you to the City of Angels International Christian Church Sunday service. With that, let's go ahead and bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so, so much, God, to just be able to worship you. We thank you, God, that we're a part of a worldwide family, a worldwide movement. And God, we just do pray that you would bless this service, God, and please give us faith, give us courage to be able to live out your will, God. We're so, so grateful to be your disciples, God, and we're so, so thankful, God, for anyone who's visiting and tuning into these services, God, that you are drawing near to you. We do pray that you open up their eyes and open up their hearts and inspire them to live according to your will. Please bless this service, God. We love you so much. We're so grateful. Pray this all in your Holy Son, Jesus' name. Amen.
family. My name is Kirk. This is my amazing wife, Margie, and we lead the awesome East region. We're grateful to be able to share the communion message this morning. Uh, Grateful for what Jesus did on the cross for us. And uh, we're grateful to be able to direct all of our hearts into his presence. The scripture that we decided to uh, reflect on this morning is in John chapter nine in verse one. Uh, It's an incredible account of Jesus proclaiming his divinity, but also proclaiming his humanity to us. And in verse one, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seen. You know, it's so incredible to read this passage because it's a passage that Margie and I have read over the course of the last two years quite frequently. Um, We put ourselves in the the shoes of these two parents who... uh, had a beautiful boy, and uh, as they were raising him, they realized that he's born blind. And um, I think for all of us who are parents, we can uh, reflect on what it was like when we first got the news that we were going to um, bring a child into the world. There's a lot of excitement, a lot of nervous feelings, a lot of joy, and um, you start dreaming of what you're going to do together. You start dreaming of what, what's going to be the future. What's, what's your family going to look like? What are the times that you're trying to have together? And, um, you know, all those dreams and visions just get more and more as the pregnancy goes on and on. And then the baby comes and along with a lot of sleepless nights, there's a lot of joy and, uh, you now are a family. And as, um, as these two parents were raising their child, they, they realized that he's a little different. Uh, that as the other children are, are beginning to interact and are able to do things, uh, their son couldn't. Their son, for whatever reason, was unresponsive, um, couldn't almost see in front of him. And over the year or two years of, uh, of the boy's life, they, they realize that he, in fact, is blind. And as a parent, um, you can relate with, with the pain that's associated with that. And, and not only the pain of, of what, what the future is going to look like, but the pain of the dreams that you were going to have and the visions that you had are now gone. Um, at least they're altered. Um, I think for us, we felt a lot like these parents would have felt in this situation. And uh, just as uh, this crowd came to Jesus with this question, who sinned? Uh, you want to blame people. You want to find fault. You, who, whose fault is this? And I, I can definitely say that Margie and I, we, we've struggled with those feelings. And we've had to come back to to God's answer in the scriptures, that God wants to display his works in in us and in our children. And um, 
a year ago is when we received the news that our daughter, our beautiful daughter, Lena, uh, was diagnosed with autism. And uh, for us, the news was very, very heart wrenching. Uh, it was difficult for us. It, it was something that, uh, quite honestly, was on the horizon, but we just, we, frankly, we were just unprepared for. It. Um, and those dreams and visions and aspirations that we had were were were, were gone. They changed significantly. They altered. They were scratched completely. And we we both were were shooken by it. Um, we we both had a, a difficult time reconciling what is God doing. And I think it's so incredible that Jesus speaks to the darkness and the light, and he proclaims, I am the light of the world. And I, I find it so fitting because in this tragedy of these two parents having a son who's born blind, there was great darkness around them. And yet Jesus, he wants to come in and produce light in every situation. And, and that's what's brought us great comfort in our situation, that even in the darkness of what's, what's to come, what's going on, how do we do this? How do we, how do we persevere through this? How do we reconcile this and accept this, that God wants to bring light into the situation? Even in Jesus going to the cross in that darkness, God still was able to produce a beautiful light. I want to hand it over to my amazing wife, Margie. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, as Kirk said, about a year ago, our daughter got diagnosed with autism. And I remember that Friday morning, he asked if we could go to the park. And I remember he let me know um, of her diagnosis. We had gotten Lena evaluated about two months before that. Um, and I remember we prayed together um, and we cried. Um, there was many tears. Um, and some of them, and it was a hard time, but I'm really grateful uh, that we were able to pray together and really just cry out to God about what was going on in our hearts. Um, I think part of those tears, or some of those tears were tears of relief, relief that we knew uh, that we finally had an answer to why our daughter was a different, why her social interactions were different, why her speech was delayed. Um, some of those tears were tears of, of sadness um, because I was mourning the daughter that I thought I would have. Um, some of those tears were tears of anger because I felt like uh, it, life was unfair. Um, but I'm really grateful uh, for the cross. Um, I'm really grateful uh, for Jesus. I know that many of us may be facing a tragedy right now or we have had faced one, but I love that. Jesus understands us. He understands our suffering. Uh, he understands the pain that we're going through. And I can't imagine what Mary felt seeing her son be murdered before her eyes. But I love that even through that, Jesus can be our comfort. Um, through the times that we're facing, we can feel alone and Jesus felt alone. Um, but what's awesome is that his, you know, God was displayed in his life and God wants to display himself in our lives. And that's the comfort that we get. And I don't know if you, what you're going through right now, but I encourage you to remember that God sees you, that God hears you, that God wants um, to be there for you, and that he wants to give you the strength to overcome. Thank you for letting me share. As we take the communion, the bread and the juice, let us reflect on the fact that God can make a tragedy beautiful. That even in tragedy, God produces beauty. And today we do not speak to you as leaders. We don't speak to you as an evangelist or a women's ministry leader or of any other title. We speak to you just simply as disciples. Disciples of Jesus following. And even when it's dark and the, the honest truth is that we're still going through this. We still have the path in front of us, albeit just one or two steps. And then we have to trust in him all over again. But God is displaying himself in us and God is, is desiring to display himself in your lives as well. So as we take the bread and as we take the juice, let us reflect on the fact that God has produced an incredible, beautiful tragedy, a beauty that surpasses all life's circumstances. With that, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for all that you've done, Father. Thank you for even in our tragedies, God. You desire to produce an incredible miracle. And the miracle, Father, is not always what we expect. It's not always what we would what we would want. But, Father, we understand that your ways are higher than our ways. And that even in the tragedies of life and, 
and illnesses and diseases and, and disorders that, Father, you still are working. You're still working, Father, to produce a light-filled path for us to make it all the way back home to you. Father, help us to reflect on our hearts during this time that as we take this bread and as we take this juice, that, Father, we reflect and we say we trust in your plan above all else. Thank you, Father, for the incredible honor it is to know you. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.
Morning, family. Well, it is uh, incredible to be here with you. This is the part of the service that we call the contribution. Uh, and uh, my name is Tim. This is my lovely wife, Leanne. And uh, we are honored to share with you what contribution means to us. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd love to share this uh, inspiring scripture with you from Exodus 35. Here, Moses is um, calling the people of God to give generously to the building of the tabernacle, much like God is calling us today to the building up of the kingdom around the world. In Exodus 35, starting in verse 20, um, Moses gives this incredible charge to the people to be generous and to give to the tabernacle. And then in verse 20, it says, Then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence. And everyone who was willing and whose heart was moved, then came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting, for all its service and for the sacred garments. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds, brooches, earrings, rings, and ornaments. They all presented their gold as a wave offering to the Lord. If you look down in uh, chapter 36, verse 4, So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, The people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. Then Moses gave an order and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing any more because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. Wow. Um, here we see God calling the people to help build the tabernacle. And we see that they bring so much that they have to be restrained and stopped from bringing any more. I really believe that this is the spirit that's at work in the City of Angels Church. Um, People are so generous. They're giving uh, everything that they can toward building up of God's kingdom around the world. And, uh, you know, it's so exciting. We've only got six weeks left, literally 42 days. And and I believe we're not only going to hit our... Uh, goal to support our missionaries around the world, but we're going to exceed it. And just like we see here, we're going to have to put the word out um, seven weeks, eight weeks from now when we've completely knocked out our missions goal. We're going to go, hey guys, it's enough. We've hit the goal. Stop giving (laughs) missions, but keep giving your weekly contribution. But um, uh, I I just believe this is is a a foreshadowing of what we're going to see happen here Uh, in the City of Angels Church. My lovely wife, Leanne, wants to share her heart for missions. Well, happy Sunday, everyone. It's great being together this morning, and uh, I'm so grateful for contribution for this scripture. I love the fact that the Bible talks about both men and women gave. So there was a willingness from both. There's a balance there. I love that. The women were giving just as much as the men, and, and the heart really was to build up God's temple, build up God's uh, honor amongst the people of the world. And, you know, I think today that's that's what we do with our contribution. We have willingness in our hearts to give and really build up God's kingdom in incredible ways. And, uh, you know, something, of course, close to my heart when I think of contribution is that it saves lives, literally and uh, spiritually saves lives. Uh, when we were in India, my eldest son and myself got very sick. And if it wasn't for the missions, we could very well have lost our lives uh, on the foreign field. And I'm so grateful. I know Tim was super grateful. Uh, I remember him crying about it, just the generosity of the disciples and how quick people were to jump in the gap um, so that my son and I could be here among you today. And so I'm so grateful uh, for contribution. I'm so grateful for the scripture. And uh, I love you guys a lot. Amen. So as you as you can imagine, uh, as uh, missionaries, uh, missions means a lot to us because we were on the receiving end of this help. And so we are very committed 
uh, to giving as the now the Chalinors, the, the Morenos, the Smellies, so many amazing brothers and sisters are out on the mission field. And uh, we are going to do our part to make sure that we take care of them out there. And so I just want to thank you for your incredible hearts to give. I want to thank every Bible Talk leader for uh, going through your Bible Talk and making sure that everybody's got a great plan and uh, to hit their mission's goal in, a, in an inspirational way. And uh, uh, I'm just so grateful for the incredible ways that God is working individually uh, in the lives of every brother and sister to help you to hit your mission school uh, because it's really his mission school. And so without further ado, let's pray for our missions contribution and our weekly contribution. Father God, thank you so much, Lord, for this incredible opportunity that we have. We get to give to missions. We get to give our weekly contribution. We we get to walk with you, God. Um, we know how to go to you when we want something, God, but um, we know what you want. You want souls saved. You want countries evangelized, God. And um, we want to be with you, Lord. We want to walk with you. We want to be close to you. And, and to do that, we know that we've got to be with you in what you want and what you want to do, Father. Uh, thank you for the incredible privilege to give uh, to World Missions. Thank you for the incredible uh, privilege to give our weekly contribution. We're so lucky and so blessed to be part of the kingdom of God uh, with all the amazing benefits and blessings that come with that. And uh, we love you so much. We pray this name your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Right now, we're going to be spotlighting different heroic stories in our special missions contribution as we evangelize a lost world. Well, we've got 35 days until special missions contribution. In the U.S., we are rich here compared to the rest of the world, but the U.S. disciples share the wealth. We're supporting our spiritual families in third world countries and planning even more churches. In the Orange County region, there's a heroic married couple who are blowing it out to make this dream into a reality, Matt and Anna Granados. Hey family, my name's Matthew Granados. This is my wonderful wife, Anna. We're representing the, the heat, heat sector, sector of Orange, Orange County. County. Since the beginning, missions has totally impacted our lives. With bringing Raul and Linda Moreno on the mission field that helped baptize Anna and I back in 2008. This year, our disciples at the time, uh, James and Jen Kane, sat down with us, shared a few scriptures, and helped us come up with our missions goal. So when we originally told Matt and Anna about their special missions goal, you could see at first it was like, oh, okay. And then I was like, well, that's each. And then he was like, amen. But what we really love about Matt and Anna is that they have a heart to serve God's kingdom, to give God's kingdom, and they have the mentality to make it happen no matter what. We were very tempted to focus on paying off of one of our vehicles instead of focusing our hearts on special missions. March, we had a cancer scare with myself. We decided to fast and pray about our special missions and really just trust God in it. Mm -hmm. So we gave our special missions, we wrote the check for $3,600 and gave it all to God. He answered our prayers of taking the cancer away. With the stimulus check that we got, it completely refilled our bank account. And at the same time, he blessed me with a promotion at work. God gave his word and he kept his word. We now want to introduce you to a young woman from the campus ministry. She lost her job, but God answered her faith. From the West Region, Audrey Davies. Greetings from SMC West Region. Um, this year's goal for me personally was 2,500, and I really was just challenged by um, that goal because I didn't see myself being able to complete it. Um, when I was on the phone with Nicholas Cly, I was just like, well, bro, I don't know if I could do this, but... She said, hey, well, let me get back to you about my pledge, and I really didn't know what to expect. Um, I was luckily able to pray on it and came up to the solution of making a goal of 4000 I, I, I was at a loss for words. Um, you know, she's just a hardworking college student 
working a part-time job um, and just has an incredible heart to really make it happen for God. I was able to map out my goal to see where I could just cut back, but then the quarantine hit and everything was completely wiped out. Um, my family didn't really approve of me wanting to give towards that, especially with my stimulus check, and so I really had to make the hard decision to really just put God first. Um, and although I really loved my family, especially my mom, I had to make the decision to put my faith first. And so during that time, it was really challenging for me because I was just super overwhelmed with persecution. I really had to come in prayer and really seek advice from sisters such as Haley J. Sion and Elizabeth McDonald and my discipler Marion. Audrey is one of the most sacrificial women that I know. I remember during her cross Bible study after we finished watching The Passion, she turned to me and she said, nothing else really matters. It's all about the cross. And she's been the same ever since. She's been so passionate about giving to God so that it can help our family throughout the world. Um, luckily, I was able to receive my unemployment check and I was not only receiving what was deserved for me in that time, but I was receiving all the back pay from that. And I was able to just knock out missions that same day. Um, and I was just super thankful that God just made a way for me to really be able to stick to my word, helping others be able to be saved ultimately. Depend on God in this time and seek him through prayer. He's going to help you get through this time. This is so inspiring. We're living in a time where people are committed and working together to make the impossible a reality for our God. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Anna. And thanks, Audrey, for your heart and faith here in the City of Angels Church. And remember, we spotlight a hero so others can see the shadow of Christ. Good morning. It's an honor to preach to the kingdom this morning. Um, what a great day for us to be together. We are also celebrating in these few days uh, Memorial Day. So I want to give a, a good, uh, honorable thank you to all the servicemen and women who gave their lives so that we could have freedom to even to worship. Thank you so very much for your service. Also want to say thank you to Corns. Great welcome, guys. Uh, and Kirk and Margie, dear friends of ours. What a great communion. And of course, Tim and Leanne and the contribution. Thank you so much. Inspiring us to give. Guys, let's really do our best to give, to contribution, to give to missions, to do our best so that we can see this world evangelized. And we have some, some churches to get out this year and some people to take care of. So really appreciate your sacrifice and thank you. You know, one of my weaknesses uh, in school growing up was math. <laughs> now, I come from a family of accountants and uh, engineers and mathematically minded people. As I progressed through high school, I, I, I would get through, you know, of course, algebra and then, uh, then the calculus stuff and then the trig. The trig stuff threw me. And I found myself calling home to my mom, who was an accountant, to get help. I would say, Lord, help me. Lord, save me. I can't do this. I cannot do this. I, I can remember getting to college and getting into all the other things and still calling home sometime. I need a way. Help me out, mom here. Uh, I need help. Lord, save me. The title of my message today is Lord, save me. You know, right now, so many of you who are watching this service online, uh, are in situations where perhaps you are afraid there's some things going on and you might be saying, Lord, save me. There's some that are suffering, perhaps because of illness in your own body, but perhaps illness in a loved one. Um, you may be facing financial issues. Uh, it could perhaps be just an issue of loneliness, being locked up in the house and not being able to fellowship with you guys. Uh, it's so different. Uh, I miss it. I miss the praying together. I miss taking communion with everybody. I miss singing with everybody. It is tough. So maybe perhaps it is loneliness because I'm lonely for all of you. I know that. Um, you know, I was reading the, the good news email this week and God, thank you for the good news email. There's so much good happening around the world, even in the midst of this coronavirus era that I would encourage you to read it. Don't miss a word of it. It will encourage your soul. But it also lets us know things we need to pray for. 
uh, people we need to pray for, uh, such as uh, our sister in New York, Shandantia, who is off the ventilators now, but has been very sick. Keep her in your prayers. Or like Pam Boye, who's been a mother to so many in so many churches around the world. She is sick right now and need your prayers. Or Raul, his father. Uh, we're in deep prayer and fasting for him as well. And I would ask a favor to pray for uh, my best friend in the world growing up, Hancho, who's battling ALS, and it's not victorious at the moment. There are times when we just got to cry out, Lord, save me. Be turning your Bibles right now to Matthew 14, and we're going to pick up reading in verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him on the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was alone, and the boat was already a, dis a considerable distance from land. Buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. They said, it's a ghost. They said and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. The story of Jesus walking on water occurs uh, in three of the four gospels, but only in, Matthew, in the gospel, but only in Matthew do we find that Peter is walking on the water. How crazy that must have been if you saw Peter, one of your boys, one of your friends walking on water. You know, when we think of Peter, we think of him as the kind of emotional one, the one out of control. Uh, he would lose it. This guy went from denying Jesus. First he said, I would die for you. I'd go anywhere for you. I'd do anything for you. Then he goes to denying Jesus, bringing curses on himself, even if he knew Jesus. Then he goes to cutting off soldiers' ears to defend Jesus. Wow, he has a reputation of being a little bit all over the place. But I can say this. No matter what you want to say about Peter, he is the only man other than Jesus himself to walk on water. Today, we're going to learn some several points about Peter and, and his experience and what he went through walking on water. You know, uh, here it is. Jesus has just fed 5,000. The miracles had taken place to do that. And then he was sending them all the way on the other side of the lake. And the boat had already gotten out, so I guess there was no boat. So Jesus, being Jesus, decides he's going to walk across the lake to get to them at the boat and get on the boat and get on the other side with them. Well, they see him walking on the water, and and, and, and then Peter sees him. Whoa, they were afraid. Jesus says, be calm. And, and then Peter says, if it's you, Lord, uh, uh, tell me to come and I'll come. Well, knowing Jesus, that's what he would do. Come, because Jesus knows who he is. And Peter walks on the water. Can you just imagine being that person yourself? And then he takes his eyes off of Jesus and he begins to sink. And Jesus, and Jesus has to grab him. But this is something interesting. He grabbed him and saved him. Peter said, Lord, save me. And, and Jesus did that very thing. But they still had some way to go to the boat and they walk back together to the boat. I could just picture it at that point in time. Well, they get in the boat. The other guys, having seen what had happened, they begin to worship Jesus. And they said, truly, you are the son of God. Lord, save me. Number one, we must keep our eyes fixed on Jesus at all times. You see, it was when Peter took his eyes off of the Lord. He started out with his eyes on Jesus and walking toward him. 
And great things were happening while his eyes were focused on Jesus. But then all of a sudden the wind, I guess, may have picked up a little bit, but the waves, they scared him. A few storms scared him and he looked down. He took his eyes off of Jesus. And so like us at times, you know, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. But then the storms of life come and the challenges of life come. And, and, and we take our eyes off Jesus and begin to sink. You know, in Hebrews 12, it says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Fixing our eyes on Jesus is important. Why? Because he is the author of faith. What does that mean? I mean, he wrote the book of faith. These very words are him. And he says, keep your eyes fixed on me. Keep your eyes in the word. The other thing, he's the perfecter of faith. So in other words, he went the road of the cross. He kept his faith. He did. How much trial did he go through? And yet he kept his faith. He perfected what faith is. And that is staying faithful until the very end. We've got to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. What might that look like for you this morning, keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus? Well, perhaps it means a refixing. You need to look at your life and refocus it on Jesus and return to the Lord. Perhaps it's a need to increase your prayer and your fasting, calling on the name of God, saying, Lord, save me. Lord, save this world. Perhaps it is remembering the answer to everything that is going on in this world. Every ill, every challenge, every problem, every bit of darkness. The answer to it all is Jesus. As disciples, as we navigate this world, we have got to keep our eyes on the destination. Fix your eyes on Jesus. I dare say even stare at him and never lose eye contact. When I fell away some years ago, um, I, asked my, I said to myself, why would I do that? I found myself in a situation, why would I just leave God, leave the church, leave, leave what's going on. So much good has happened in my life. I mean, I became a Christian within six months. I'd received a call from here in LA to come uh, to train and uh, was going to do the AMS ministry. I think in that course of time, um, it took me seven days or so to just get out here to call, pack up and everything, seven days. Um, I think about the amounts of mission in my first year as a Christian, 30, 35 times, somewhere around there, but I knew it was a lot, but I was fired up in all those situations. What could happen to me? What could happen to me that I would fall away from God? Well, I can tell you what happened. Number one, I took my eyes off Jesus. I stopped looking to Jesus to deal with my pain and chose other things. In my needs, now I'm with four children. I'm a single father. I'm trying to figure it all out. But I didn't look to Jesus for my needs to take care of my children. All of my dreams seemed over. I stopped looking at Jesus. I had three girls and it, and a boy, but the three girls had massive hair. And I had to learn how to comb hair and everything. And I was thinking, 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 Lord, save me from this. But I had just taken my eyes off of Jesus. At that time, I should have been more fixed on Jesus than at any other time in my life. Thank goodness he did not take his eye off of me. Now, maybe you're going through a tough time right now. Maybe it's one of your toughest times that you're going through as a disciple. And there could be a myriad of reasons for that being. But I could tell you the answer for those. Is keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Number two, when Jesus says, come, obey him. Obey him. You know, a lot of us still wander for the truth. Here, Peter would never have done anything if he just wasn't obedient to Jesus. It did not make sense getting out of the boat on wavy water and walking, thinking you could walk. That did not make sense. But he was obedient to Jesus, even to that which does not make sense. God calls us many times to do things that don't make sense to us. 
His thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways. Sometimes giving up everything, giving up everything and denying yourself. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense. I know sometimes I don't want to deny myself. I said, it doesn't make sense to me. I'm tired. I'm hurt. I'm lonely. I want to be selfish at this time. But in obedience to Jesus, I need to obey him. And John 8 and 31, 30 cent to the Jews. And these are the Jews who were supposed to be full of knowledge and truth. He said to the Jews who had believed him, if you hold to my teachings, meaning to obey my teachings, you are really my disciples. And then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus is saying, come to many of us in many ways. He's calling you out of something. He says, come, all of you who are weary, cast your fears, cast everything on me. I can handle it. My burden is light. I can handle it. Come to me. He's saying, bring your sins to the cross. Come to me. Don't stay out in that world. Come to me. Be obedient. Come to me. That word come, and we're looking at it that way. It can mean stop what you're doing. It's a time of obedience to God. It's a time of obedience to the cross. It's a time of obedience to the word of God. It is then that we know the truth. We're no longer confused and we're strong and spiritually. Then we can walk on water. So come join God's family. Come and see that the Lord is good. Point number three, it's time to take a leap of faith. Now, Hebrews 11, one says that faith is sure of what we hope for and certain about what we do not see. That's one of the biggest challenges for us is because we want to see. Why do we want to see? Because we want to control what's happening before us. I remember the movie Indiana Jones and if you remember Harrison Ford in it, and he was on one of those adventures and he had come to a cliff, but then there was a, a, a chasm, uh, like the Grand Canyon between him and the other side. And, 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 and he, he saw that he, he had learned that it was going to take faith, that he had to step down off this cliff, possibly falling to the bottom of that cavern and, and, and have faith that it wouldn't happen. And so he takes his time, but then he takes that first leap of faith and then the bridge appears. The bridge appears and is able to go across and complete his mission. Martin Luther King said this, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. You know, uh, I'm so proud of all of our missionaries that we have out there on the field. Um, they take or took a leap of faith when they left this country and they went to other countries very foreign to them, um, where it was a difficult lifestyle. And they took their children and, and they went there for the sake of the gospel, to be participants in the building of the kingdom. I want to say, just as we continue with the mission, let us connect with why we do what we do. Let us take a leap of faith. Maybe some of you are still doubting. I say, stop doubting. I say, take the leap of faith so that you can see what our sacrifices do around the world. You gotta take a leap of faith. Some of you are pondering back and forth, is this right for me, this church thing, the kingdom thing and all that. Take a leap of faith. Some of us in the kingdom need to be more vulnerable, more open to get the help and things that we need. Take a leap of faith. I know me as a guy, I don't like to say I'm lonely. I don't like to share those kind of things because it makes me feel weak. It's a leap of faith just to jump out there and say, hey, I get lonely. I miss you guys. I, I, I can't wait for the fellowship for us to be back together again. You know, um, Peter took that step out the boat and he was doing fine until he stopped leaping or taking the next step when he looked down. We got to take that leap of faith all over again, continuously, continuing to live by faith and not by sight. What's the next step? What is the next leap that Jesus wants you to make? Think about it. Think about this. I don't know if you thought about it in the midst of uh, what's going on, but have you thought about being a missionary? Have you thought about going and planting the seed of God in other countries? How about full-time ministry? How about full-time ministry? Where I pray that 
There are leaders, there are people raising up all around the kingdom. Oh, that's a leap of faith. Because sometimes it requires leaving a job or leaving this or doing something different, coming into the kingdom and then going into the ministry. How awesome it is, but it takes a leap of faith. How about just simply that leap of repentance and come to the Lord? Let me tell you something. Your next leap of faith could turn your whole life around and make it something you never thought that it could be. Number four is faith releases miracles. Faith releases miracles. Peter did not experience the miraculous power of God that, al that allowed him to walk on the water until he trusted God fully, until he had absolute faith about who Jesus was. Once he did that, he stepped out of water. Now he could see the, the, the power of God was released as even when he began to sink, Jesus was able to grab him and raise him back up. Is there anything you need to do differently in faith? You know, I think sometimes we make big efforts to do lots of things. I think we're doing this fantastic. But do we do them with faith or are we doing because we're told? Faith is far better because when you do things by faith, when you act in faith, it releases the miracles of God in your life. Many of us have dreams and goals for the kingdom. But if your dream, if your goal is not big enough that it requires a miracle from God, it is not a faithful dream. Let us dream big. Let our faith be bigger than anything else. You see, God has chosen. He has chosen to limit what he can do through your life based on the level of your faith. You look uh, in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 9. Verse 27 and 30. Let's read this little story here. As Jesus went from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When, we had, when he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him and asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And right then and there, their sight was restored. You see, if they didn't have the faith, that miracle could not have been released into their life. Many of us have to believe, of course, Jesus can do it. And anything that we accomplish to the glory of God, Jesus will be there and backing us up. What is saying? What keeps us? Let me talk about this for a second. What keeps us from a deeper trust, this kind of faith that releases the power of God in our lives? Well, maybe you have a weak relationship with God. Maybe you have not nurtured your relationship with God. It's very easy to get distracted in all of these things that are going on. I know it is for me too. It's very tough. I get it. But the number one relationship we must always take care is that of you and God. You stop taking care of that relationship and you got to do it. Your, your prayer time, your quiet time, being in your Bible, fellowshipping, even with Zoom and all these other things we do. But don't shortcut your relationship with God. The second thing that might keep us from going at a deeper level is sin. Sin and unconfessed sin, meaning current sin that could be going on in our lives right now, or maybe something we stopped, but we haven't confessed. So if we have current, that's going to block the power of God from working in our lives. Peter doubted. He took his eyes off of Jesus and it, it was like a cut the flow of the, the miraculous power of God right there, then and there. And yet, but God being faithful, Jesus reached out and reconnected and grabbed him from drowning in the water. Why did he, why did he take his eyes off? Why did Peter do this? Fear, fear. Point five is let your faith be bigger than fear. When Peter had faith, he walked on water. When he had fear, he sank in water. And the same is true for you and me. Fear will drown you. It's debilitating. It, it keeps you from stepping out on faith. In fact, it's one of the biggest tools that Satan uses to keep you and I from giving 100% of our lives to God, to the kingdom. We start thinking, what will happen to me? What will happen to me? 
Well, I know that God says no one has given up anything for him will not fail to receive hundred times fold. God's got us and tell us, don't worry. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else will be there. But Satan will have you fear, fear that something's wrong if I give like this of myself, of my resources. No, your fear has got to be, your, your faith has got to be bigger than your fear. Do it. Do it. I remember, I remember being scared my first NBA game playing against Dr. J. Uh, Lenny Wilkins, Hall of Fame coach, said, you got to guard Dr. J. I told him he was crazy. He said, boy, get your butt off. And I was young. You know, get up, get out there. And I looked at Dr. At that time, he's not much bigger than me, but he looked like a giant. I, 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 was, I, I was scared. And I remember Lenny screaming out. He said, believe in yourself. Have a little faith. Play the game. It went pretty well after that. And I'm telling you, you got to have faith that is bigger than fear to accomplish what God wants to accomplish in your life. Here's some verses. Here's some verses for you to think about. In John 14, 27, peace is what I leave you with. It is my own peace that I give you. I do not give it as the world does. Do not be worried and do not be afraid. In 2 Timothy, in 1, for God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and self-control. Some of my favorites here, Psalms 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In Psalms 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? No one. And Deuteronomy 31, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. But I know this is a great kind of faith that I'm speaking about. And some, some may not just be there right now. What I'm going to tell you the next point is some faith is better than no faith. You know, I think about Peter and, you know, sometime in that story, we don't necessarily just think about him walking in the water. We think about him sinking. We're thinking about him taking his eyes off Jesus. We think about him being afraid. But there's a difference. Apparently, the guys in the boat didn't have any faith. How do we know? They didn't get out there and join him. They didn't go with him. They didn't experience it. <laughs> in James 2, 14 through 18, listen to this carefully. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but have no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you should say to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical need, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, getting out of the boat, it is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by getting out of the boat. You see, this is important right here. Don't let COVID-19 or anything you can think of stop you. Maybe, maybe you've only had little faith and you've shown little faith. Today, you can make a decision to show great faith. Jump out of the boat. Get out there, share, study the Bible, do something, offer your life to the kingdom, offer to God to be used, help somebody, go and forgive. There's so many areas that we need to take that leap out of the boat so we can see the miraculous power of God work in our lives. Help your brothers and sisters stay safe. You know, um, I'm thinking about it in India where they, the internet doesn't really work and how they have to work hard. They have to work hard just to communicate. I'm thinking about um, them having to go and share their faith at night, going terrace to terrace, because it's by law they can't go in the day. Look, it is time for us to live our lives with our eyes fixed on Jesus, crying out to God to save us. And here's the, here's the clue, here's the key. When you cry out, when you're a faithful disciple and you cry out to God, God will answer you according to his glory. For his glory, he will answer you. Don't be afraid to say, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. You know, on the screen here, somewhere you've probably seen our web address and different things. You can respond there. Jesus is waiting right now.
And call us, let's study the Bible. Let's look at this thing deeper. But trust me when I say, the Lord will save you as he saved all of us. God bless and thank you. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our worship service this morning. We hope you were challenged, convicted, and inspired by the Word of God today. We had the opportunity to hear from some amazing men and women of God. We had uh, Kirk and Margie Hamula deliver the communion for us. We had Tim and Leanne Kernan uh, provide a, a call to generosity in the contribution message today, uh, which is really important as we are finishing out our special missions contribution here in the next six weeks. And of course, the powerful sermon by our dear brother, Corey Blackwell, uh, who's always uh, challenging and calling us to change, to live lives, to love God and to love people. I hope you take some time to reflect on all that was shared today. Really let it get into your heart, help you to be more like Jesus in your daily life as you walk with God. Well, I'm so glad you were able to join us this morning, that you were able to worship with us. At this time, a lot of us can feel alone and isolated, um, but I really appreciate coming together on a Sunday morning, knowing that many people are together at the same time, um, hearing the Word of God and worshiping them, Him in their heart, and it just really makes me feel connected to you. And I hope you feel connected to us. I hope you feel like you're a part, um, you get to take a peek into our lives and hear our hearts about God. Um, I'm so grateful for Margie and how she shared uh, for communion. I'm so grateful for Corey. Whenever I hear Corey preach, I always walk away motivated to change. Like he helps me to want to be a better person, to grow in my relationship with God. I hope that you walk away feeling that today. If you'd like to connect to us, we would like to connect to you. We have um, some resources on our website at caicc.net uh, where you could get in touch with people to do a personal Bible study if you want to dig deeper in the scriptures. Or we have many like casual Bible discussion groups. If you just like to see what we're all about, that would be a great place to connect. Or if you really are going through a hard time, we'd love to pray for you. So you can get all those resources on our website. Please reach out to us. Um, we would love to connect with you. You know, I really appreciate Jackie uh, bringing up to, to reach out and connect and especially to study the Bible. You know, that's what's made the difference for so many of us in the church is that someone sat down and studied the Bible directly with us, taught us from the scriptures what God wants our lives to look like, and then we worked on putting those in practice and actually applying the scriptures in our lives. And I guarantee you, if you do that, it will change your life drastically. And so I'd really just encourage you to reach out on the website. We are um, part of a movement of churches, not just around Los Angeles, but around the whole United States and around the world. And so wherever you are, even if you're watching us from a, a great distance, there's probably a church nearby you uh, that we can help you get connected with to help you get closer in your relationship with God. So please reach out. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching today, and we hope you join us next week at this same time. We love you guys. Love you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? He came to earth and lived a sinless life. He died on the cross for your sins. He rose on the third day and is seated at the right hand of God. Yes, I believe. Come on. Woo! Leonard, what is your good confession? That Jesus is my Lord. Amen. Amen. LA Church from sunny Miami, Florida, here in my dad's backyard. I'm so excited about what God did last Thursday in my dad getting baptized. 81 years old, a 23 year old prayer for my father, and finally he became a disciple and made it to the saving waters of baptism. And I just want to encourage everybody if it, if, if it happened with my father, it can happen with your father, your mother, your older family members they can get baptized. I just want to encourage you. And I think the key
that I learned from this basically was uh, number one is that we need to love unconditionally. For 23 years, I've been loving my dad, and, and I still love him, obviously. And what happened was that when you love unconditionally, you create the atmosphere for them, when they have a problem, to reach out to you so they can be, get saved. That's exactly what happened with my dad. He sadly has terminal cancer, and that was one of the saddest days of my life when I heard that. But because he studied the Bible, and with Matt Sullivan and, and myself, it became one of the happiest days uh, when he got baptized. And uh, I've been working on him for, for many days, talking to him about God, talking to him about baptism and doctrine. And he, he saw it. He got it. He got it because he knew that life was coming to an end. So building the atmosphere of love is very important. Number two, we need to create opportunities. We need to have churches everywhere where there's disciples that can go after your family members. That's why I want to thank the LA Church for your special contributions. Because every special contribution means churches planted all over the world so they can save other fathers, other mothers, other sisters, other brothers. And, and I'm so grateful that we have a church here in Miami that Matt, Sullivan, and I were able to study with my father. And you know how it is. Fathers don't pay attention to their sons much. But he heard Matt really, really well when Matt opened the scriptures to him. And finally, I think it's the collective prayers of the saints. I mean, there were hundreds of people praying for my dad. Like the church in Santiago, the church in Sao Paulo, the churches in Latin America. Many in, in the States were praying for my father because they knew he was very ill. And God answered the prayers, just like 2 Corinthians 1, verse 11. As you help us by your prayers... When the saints collectively pray for one thing, it's really, really powerful. So I want to encourage you, let's go save our parents. God is good, and to God be the glory. Amen. Okay, what is your good confession? Señor, ¡Vamos! ¡Fuera esa! Por, por tu buena confesión, te puedo bautizar ahora para el perdón de todos tus pecados, para recibir el Espíritu Santo y ser bienvenido a esta grande familia. ¡Amén! Yeah. <laughs> yeah.